This is a podcast by The Straits Times. Welcome to Green Pulse, a podcast series by The Straits Times where we analyze the beats of the changing environment, from biodiversity conservation to climate change. I'm your host, Audrey Tan, and I cover science and environment for The Straits Times. My co host is David Fogarty. Hi, I'm David, and I'm the climate change editor at The Straits Times. It is the 27th of January. Today, we discuss one of the strongest and most worrying climate change indicators that not many may immediately think about. Ocean heat content. A new study recently found that in 2021, the ocean was the hottest it has ever been. Why does this matter? With us today is one of the co-authors of that study, Dr. Kevin Trenbreth from the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. Thanks for joining us today, Kevin. Thanks for having me. So let's start by talking about the warmer oceans. We know the oceans are getting hotter, but could you put hot in context for us? Well, the amount of heat that was gained in 2021 relative to 2020 was about 14 zeta joules. A joule is a measure of of heat. It's a watt per second. And a zeta joule is a one with 21 zeros after it. So it's equivalent to running a toaster, assuming a toaster is about 1,000 watts. Uh, So there's about 440 trillion toasters running continuously uh, in order to generate that amount of heat. And another way of looking at it is the total energy generated by all humans is about half a zeta joule. So it's a factor of 28 or so times all of the energy used by humans around the planet. So that's a lot of toasters and a lot of energy that's going into our oceans. So the oceans are stratified. Uh, Warm water sits on top of cold water. The very deep ocean is very cold. And since we're adding heat to the ocean from the surface, it actually increases that temperature gradient from the top down to the bottom. And that actually makes the ocean a little bit more stable. That means it's harder to get stuff down than it used to be. That includes heat. It includes carbon dioxide because the ocean takes up carbon dioxide and other chemicals and and gases. And and in particular, it includes oxygen. And so all of these things have important implications for all marine critters that are in the ocean whether it's the smallest plankton, to the fisheries, to the marine mammals, the seals and otters and and seabirds and whales and so on. Uh, All of these critters are greatly affected by these increases in temperature, the changes in stability, and the fact that on top of this, some spots of the ocean actually get very hot. And we call these marine heat waves, you know, loosely referring to them as as hotspots, depending upon how long they last. But the ocean also plays a very important role as a heat sponge. It takes up, you know, because it takes up a lot of heat. This heat comes from, I guess, ultimately the sun. So the oceans have been absorbing about 90% of the heat trapped by greenhouse gas emissions. The oceans are becoming a little bit more stable, a little bit more stratified. We can actually measure that now. But uh, the capacity of the oceans to take up a lot of heat is certainly huge. Uh, you, you put a pot of water on the stove and turn the element on, and it takes quite a long time for that pot of water to heat up. And so there's two factors involved. One of them is the um, mass of the water that's involved. And secondly, the fact that water has a very high heat capacity. So it takes a lot of heat to simply warm up the temperature of water by, say, one degree. So the main oceans have been clearly warming I think since the 1970s, if you look at just the sea surface temperatures. So the heat is gradually penetrating down, and that process will continue, which also means that that even if you stop climate change, the oceans continue to warm for some time uh, after that, and sea level continues to rise as well. So net zero, so-called which is a, a goal, a target for a number, increasing number of countries, even when we get to net zero, some changes will continue to occur. 
So I don't think people realize how much the oceans are actually acting as a break on climate change. And I was wondering whether there are any estimates that show that, you know, without the oceans, how much more global temperatures could have risen by. I think the latest from the IPCC last year was that from pre-industrial times, the world has already warmed by 1.1 degrees Celsius. Yes, but the rate of warming over land is slightly more than double that over the oceans. If you just look at land versus oceans, the average warming over land is about two degrees. And uh, in the Arctic, uh, it's even more than that, a little bit higher than that even still. And uh, some parts of the planet where it doesn't have the advantage of being able to move the heat into deeper layers and so on, the consequences are, are greater. So certainly the oceans uh, help an enormous amount in that regard. But on the other hand, they're also storing up this heat. And, and so it's having more and more consequences of the fact that the planet has been warming. With all that carbon dioxide that humans are putting into the atmosphere, some of that dissolves into the ocean as carbonic acid. Yes, yeah, so, so the emissions that we put into the atmosphere, which is the causes of the global warming, the global heating that's going on, about half of it remains in the atmosphere, but about, on average in recent times, I think the best number is about 27% of the carbon dioxide goes into the ocean, and that causes acidification of the ocean. Uh, the other quarter or so goes into the biosphere. And so trees are growing more rapidly in, in certain places, at least. Uh, on the other hand, then we have also had more wildfires, which are putting carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. And so some of it just goes around. But yeah, in the ocean, uh, the ocean has been an important sink, not only of heat, but also of carbon dioxide. And as the ocean becomes more stratified through the ocean heating it, but in the upper layers, it's apt to take up less carbon dioxide. And another factor is that as the ocean warms up, it can't actually hold quite as much of the carbon dioxide in other water. And this is like what happens if you put a pot of water on the stove and start to heat it up you find bubbles coming off and the air that is uh, dissolved into the water comes out and that includes carbon dioxide. And so as, as the water in the oceans warm up, in some sense, the carbon dioxide boils off, if you'd like to think of it that way. So that's pretty extreme. And of course, we're making relatively small changes at the moment, but that's the direction that things are going. Find us on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or via the Google Voice Assistant and Amazon Alexa-enabled devices. And now back to our podcast episode. So fish can move, but there are some other marine organisms like coral reefs, for instance, that are very susceptible to bleaching. So maybe you could tell us a bit more about that, the impacts of marine heat waves on, you know, these iconic tropical ecosystems. Corals get greatly affected by these heat waves. Some of these are in the tropics associated with the El Nino phenomenon. So El Nino is where there's a warming of the central and eastern tropical Pacific in places where normally it's relatively cool. And on the other side of the ocean, there's the Great Barrier Reef off of Australia. And all of the corals throughout the Pacific have been profoundly influenced by the major El Ninos that have been getting bigger in recent years. And so 2015-16 was a major El Nino, a super El Nino event that led to coral bleaching in quite a number of places. So, Kevin, I wanted to ask about the implications of a hotter ocean on sea level rise, since, as we've just discussed, you know, water, like all matter, expands when heated. So a hotter ocean, I guess, means faster sea level rise, if that's correct. Yes, that's correct. So the ocean expands with the increased ocean heat content. And in addition, the ocean is getting more massive because of the melting of glaciers on land, ice on land, including Greenland and Antarctica and all of the glaciers, putting more water into the ocean. And so since we've had altimeters in space in late 1992, the overall sea level rise has been a little bit over three millimeters per year. But in the last 10 years or so, it's been more like four millimeters per year. So this evidence of acceleration of the rate of sea level rise as well. 
And so, um, I don't know, 40% or so of that is from the expansion of the ocean, the ocean heat content, and uh, most of the rest of it comes from putting more water into the ocean from the melting of glaciers, which has also been accelerating in recent times as a part of climate change. So this, of course, greatly affects coastal regions, and uh, high tides are a little bit higher, but in particular, when there are onshore wind flows, water can pile up a little bit more, and there's been increasing instances of so-called sunny day flooding, uh, where beautiful, clear day, and suddenly you've got flooding in streets in Miami or Norfolk, Virginia, or San Francisco, and no doubt other places around the world, simply because uh, the sea level is, is going up and it has consequences. One of those consequences, I guess, is with a hotter ocean is literally like adding fuel to the fire. It's uh, providing more energy for weather systems, so stronger storms, for example. Yes. So the oceans are the primary memory of all of the climate change that has occurred in the past. Uh, the oceans are warmer. Perhaps the best example is to look at some of the hot spots that we've seen around the tropics that tend to then attract a lot more activity, uh, and in particular, more hurricanes. And so the hurricanes are bigger, uh, more intense, longer lasting, and uh, with prodigious amounts of rainfall, more rainfall associated with them. And there's been quite a number of examples of that. More generally, uh, the oceans are warmer. And so any storm that comes along picks up more moisture from over the oceans, takes it into the storm. We can get heavier rains. Uh, we've seen a lot of that around the world. Uh, the storms in the extra tropics just develop a little bit differently than they otherwise would. They're not necessarily more intense, but they can be bigger and certainly also have consequences as a result. But, you know, the biggest overall consequence is that many of these storms are dumping huge amounts of water when they occur. And these so-called atmospheric rivers in coastal regions that bring rivers of moisture in the atmosphere on land, they hit the land a little bit of a mountain, and suddenly you've got a deluge and a tremendous amount of rainfall. So just as a final question, and I think you've probably partially um, answered this already. So even if humans stopped adding emissions to the atmosphere, which of course would be a wonderful thing, um, the oceans would still continue to heat up, I guess, right? Or, or certainly the, a lot of that excess heat will remain in the ocean for quite a long time. Is that is that correct? Yes, yes. And the best estimates are that the very, very deep ocean is still feeling the effects from 10,000 years ago. Uh, and so the deep ocean, it, it parts of the deep ocean uh, have not been in touch with the atmosphere, if you like to think of it that way, for a thousand years. So there are certain parts of the ocean which are more in touch, if you like, to think of it that way. The Atlantic is certainly one where there's this overturning circulation. I referred to it before as the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation. But the deeper parts of the Pacific, they've been sitting there for hundreds, thousands of years without much involvement. So the effects of what's going on up above and, and on the sides uh, gradually influences that. But then, of course, you know, a thousand years from now, some of that will still be there. And, and so the oceans are very slowly responding to the integrated history of everything that has happened to it, whether it's natural from changes in the sun or the orbit of the earth around the sun, which is what, you know, brings on the major ice ages that occur on planet earth, or whether it's the human influences that we're uh, producing now. So, you know, stuff that takes us 10 years to do will take nature hundreds of years to undo, if you like to think of it that way. And in fact, you know, we could end up melting Greenland and I don't know if it could ever come back uh, in quite the same way at all. You know, it's not a great big ice block and it doesn't melt uniformly just around the edges. It has all of these channels that develop and water starts to flow and but, you know, the best estimate is that if, well, Greenland is starting to melt now, but it, it could melt all in a time frame of about 800 years. It's still quite a long time, but once it's gone, how would we ever get it back again? It's, it's far from clear. 
So thanks, Kevin, for coming on our show today and explaining all about ocean dynamics to us. We may be surrounded by the sea here in Singapore, but we don't really know much about it. Well, it's an important topic, and I, I hope I've helped a little bit here. And uh, the oceans continue to get warmer year after year. That's the best evidence that the planet is warming and, uh, you know, sounding an alarm bell, if you like to think of it that way. Well, that's a wrap for Greenhouse, and we hope you enjoyed our discussion. For more on climate change and the environment, do check out our stories in The Straits Times. And don't forget to subscribe to our Green Pulse podcast series on your favourite audio apps, Apple Podcasts, Spotify or Google Podcasts. That was a podcast by The Straits Times. Send your feedback to podcast at sph.com.sg. Find us on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts or via the Google Voice Assistant and Amazon Alexa-enabled devices. For more podcasts by The Straits Times, The Business Times and Money FM 89.3, you can also download the audio by SPH app. That's A-W-E-D-I-O.